Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our next Provoke EMEA Summit session. My name is Arun Sudhaman. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all virtually. It's such a shame we can't be together in person, um, but I'm hopeful that this is the next best thing. Um, and I think this session will hopefully bear that out. Um, we're going to talk about the real concrete changes that are needed in terms of improving racial inclusion in the PR industry. Um, I can't think of a topic that is better timed given the moment we find ourselves in now. We've seen the push for change sweep across America and other countries, including the UK. Um, but in this industry, I think we all know that talk is not enough. Um, I think black people working in the public relations industry know this better than most. For several years now, our coverage has reflected the industry's woeful record on racial and cultural inclusion. Um, every study, every initiative is supported by well-meaning rhetoric, uh, but the rate of progress has been slow. Um, and that perhaps helps to explain why many from underrepresented backgrounds see these promises as corporate platitudes rather than concrete action. Um, it's nice and it's great and it's encouraging to see systemic racism being openly acknowledged and addressed. Um, but I think we have to be clear that real change in our industry um, is still some way off. It won't be easy, um, but I think the time is now. And thankfully, we have people here on this session who are working tirelessly to make a difference. We're very lucky to be joined by four of them. I'm going to introduce them very quickly. I'll start with Elizabeth Bananuka. We named Elizabeth as one of our people to watch in 2020. Um, She's only just gone and launched uh, a scheme called The Blueprint two weeks ago, uh, which I think is really a watershed in terms of the concrete commitments that agencies can make to ensure they are meeting expectations in terms of racial diversity and inclusion in the public relations industry. Um, Elizabeth is also founder of BME PR Pros, and in her spare time, she's a freelance communications consultant. Absolutely. Absolutely. I even have time to watch crap on Netflix. Can you believe it? Excellent. Um, <laughs> we've got... Julian, Julian is like, oh my God, this has started badly. <laughs> yeah, we started Sorry. well. We've started well. Not expected. Not expected, I'd say. <laughs> well. So um, we've also got Sarah Hawthorne, who's M MD Managing Director at Infusion Comms. Um, we have Nick Govia, who's CEO founder at Blurred. And we have Julian Obubo, who's the Brand Strategy Director at Manifest. Um, so just quickly, Manifest is the first agency to secure full blueprint status. Um, while Blurred and Infusion have been awarded blueprint ally status. And that's based on their performance against 23 commitments from recruitment to working culture which is aimed at promoting the ethnic diversity from work experience to board level. And this is all benchmarked by an independent panel. Um, so I want to start off, I think, well, we actually have two choices here. I can either come to you, Elizabeth, and ask you a question, or we actually have a poll in place that we can ask people to take, um, which is actually your idea, Elizabeth. You wanted us to ask um, how many people have uh, exist had sorry existing data and targets driven DNI strategies in place before Black Lives Matter, and how many have put them in after? Um, yes. So that poll is live next to the video, and people can 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 start taking part in that now. Yeah, um, that's great. Maybe while they're doing that, I'll come to you with the first question. Um, and obviously, the first question is about the blueprint. The blueprint. Um, particularly in the context of some of the promises and progress we've seen the industry make on diversity and inclusion. Why now? Why does it matter so much? And what are its chances for success? Um, so first of all, just, just a slight correction on what you said, Arun. So the way 
you apply for the blueprint is by filling out an application form of nearly 40 questions. And the 40 questions to are a sense of where you're at and your existing commitment to diversity and inclusion. Based on this application form, you're given a score. 70 to 101 gives you blueprint ally status. 100 and, uh, sorry, 70 to 100 is blueprint ally status. 101 to 130 is full blueprint status. And the purpose of this is, and the reason why we've made it very clear that you have to have something in place, is I feel that I need, to, and I will speak on behalf of black people here, and actually, you know, loads of black people are gonna go on Twitter and say, she's not talking on my behalf. So, okay, I will speak as a black person, is, I, I, you know, quite frankly, I'm absolutely tired by the diversity initiatives that, that have existed. I feel so many diversity initiatives have actually given um, ethnic minorities an extremely raw deal. And, you know, I feel so many times, you know, that the utter wrench and anger I feel when someone announces a new diversity initiative, they post photos on LinkedIn, everyone thinks they're amazing, there's a press release, and then a year later, six months later, you, wonder, you ask, you know, what happened with that? And no one ever will respond with anything. And and, you know, constantly having these people used. I've worked on diversity initiatives where we have, you know, shipped in a whole lot of young black men from Lewisham to learn how to be videographers. Did any of them get a job in film and television? Absolutely not. Um, so the, the, the purpose of the blueprint, and I'm really clear about this, and I'm unapologetic about this, the target audience is black, Asian, middle, mi mixed race and ethnic minorities. It has to work for them. So this, so, you know, for those agencies that have got in touch and said, oh, this is a lot of work. Well, you know what? It's cool because this isn't for you. If you think it's a lot of work, as I've said, to a lot of people what I think is a lot of work is ethnic pay gaps gender pay gaps racism inequality those are hard work a 40 question application form isn't hard work so one of the things for this that, that was really important with the blueprint is actually people doing the work and in every sense of what that work is um, so for us you get the blueprint kite mark based on what your status is, based on the work you're doing already. And the reason why you need to have done work before is to ensure that we are putting ethnic minorities in safe environments, that we are avoiding getting a whole load of black people in an agency that's fundamentally got a toxic culture. If you haven't done the work and reflected what it means to diversify your workforce, if you think it is as crude as getting an Indian guy in, you will not get it. You will not provide the environment where someone can flourish, someone can nourish. So we have made you prove you have done enough to put those commitments in place, those structures in place. Then what you have is 23 commitments. And the com commitments kick off quite quickly. In March of next year, Infusion comms, blurred, manifest, will all have to release their diversity data in March, that is. And that's something they're gonna have to do. And they will have to be open to whatever questions they get from that. This is part of what the commitments is. And then this is a two year process. In two years, they have an opportunity. Do you want to reapply? Or do you want to leave it as and we remove the status from you? And those are questions they will have to answer. If someone says to them, why haven't you reapplied? They'll have to turn up and say, we either didn't do well enough, we don't think it matters. That is absolutely their core. But that alone is a level of accountability that other initiatives haven't had. And even, you know, it's easy to turn around and say, well, Manifest have got this. Actually, what was interesting when I spoke to Judy and said, look, this is what you guys have got. I was very, I mean, me and my team were quite humbled, I guess, and quite surprised by their response, which is pretty much like, yikes, we're going to have to work even harder. The assumption is, from Manifest's point, is that this isn't the end point, this is a starting point, and actually it's the same with blood and infusion, and that's really important, because in, in two years' time, what I want from all these guys is where are you at? What have you changed? So, you know, with 23%, you can turn around and say, well, Manifest has pretty much nailed something. Well, if that's the case, how many of their account execs are now account directors? That's the kind of stuff. You know, if Sarah, for example, 50% of BMEs, 50% um, of candidates for jobs at Sarah's organization came from black, Asian, mixed race, ethnic minority backgrounds, well, maybe in a couple of years, that'll be 78%. So, those, so this is a level of accountability. It's taken away from you in two years, unless you reapply and, and if you've got to show growth. So if manifests go from full status to ally status, that's the press release they have to write to explain why. Sorry, I was on mute as always. So I think the rigor that you've just outlined is, is what's so encouraging um, about the scheme. I wanna to come to the agencies now, just to find out and get a sense from them, how difficult actually was it to, um, to meet the kind of the criteria um, uh, that, that is uh, in play in terms of the, the, the 23 commitments and so forth. Uh, maybe Julian, if, if I can start with you, um, given that Manifest is the first firm um, to, to, to get the full blueprint kite mark. 
Um, that's a good question. How difficult it is? Well, it's it's rigorous. <laughs> um, it's long, um, but I think as as Elizabeth has said, um, that serves a, a purpose. It's not something to be taken lightly. Um, it's not something to be done quickly. It's something that demands thoughts. It's something that demands data. Um, and this is a scheme that that um, has accountability as its foundation. So it has to be. I wouldn't necessarily say difficult, but it has to be rigorous. Um, and essentially, it, the, I guess for the first um, the first cohort of, of, of firms uh, applying, it's as much a, a, an assessment on what they've done prior to this. Um, and for us at Manifest, we'd, we'd always, um, I guess not always, but for, for, for a long time, we, we had um, sort of implemented diversity and, and inclusion as a core value. Um, so it, it's, it's great to be recognized and it's great that other judges have been able to, to see the work that we've done so, so far. But, um, but uh, as Elizabeth said, I think what really comes out of it as soon as you've, you've done the application and in this case gotten um, uh, a, essentially a, a plan on improvement is just how much work needs to be done and um, how accountable we need to be to the industry, but especially to ourselves. And so it, it's a great um, framework for accountability, which I think was, um, was missing in most other diversity schemes for a lack of trying one, but also because I don't think a lot of people had the forethought and the thoroughness that Elizabeth has to actually provide a certain numbers of, 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 of frameworks that people can keep to. So it's, it's accountability, I think is, is a word that's probably gonna be said a lot in this, in, in this session, but that's the most important thing because it's easy to say words and it's easy to promise things, but if you're not actually, um, check-in that you're fulfilling those promises, then it's, it's all for nothing, really. Yeah, and, and I guess accountability, it's not something you can just turn on and off. Um, Nick, from your perspective, is how much of this is kind of part, has to be part of an agency's maybe purpose, ethos, its actual journey? It's not something that you can just come up with maybe, um, you know, after visiting the Blueprint website. I think anyone who just decides this is something we need to do to tick a box just won't get through that process. It is hard, but it's rightly hard. And I think we got um, through because it is very clearly part of our purpose, part of our values. But genuinely, I was delighted when we got ally status because it became clear to us that we didn't deserve the full blueprint status yet because we're just not there yet. And the very process of going through it made us better. We thought we were good in terms of that we had a lot of stuff in place, but we realized how far we had to go. And crucially, we realized we had some massive blind spots, genuinely, that it was only by going through that that we were able to see, you know, why haven't we addressed this here? Or why haven't we done that there? Or the excuse of, you know, COVID in terms of not, um, you know, hiring, you know, broader diversity more recently just wasn't good enough, but it made us critically engage. It made us stop and go, right you know enough it's really easy you use the words well-meaning rhetoric so many people have the right intent so many people have the right desire to do this but that is not good enough and and i bet we were part of that you know it we do so many good things it's like i'm not trying to give ourselves a hard time and we got ally status for a good reason but we have realized how far we've got to go and i'm delighted by that and that we're all now properly focused on um you know seeing where we weren't seeing clearly and doing better um, but it's absolutely part of our um, our values. It's part of what we you know, advise other people to do. So of course, it's got to be you know properly properly true to us. Sarah, over to you. I mean, how challenging um, has it been from your perspective going through the blue the blueprint status? I learned to say blueprint eventually. Mm. Um, I just uh, I guess to echo what my fellow panelists have already said. It is challenging, but you know we have to point out that this took two years to get to where it is. This has been extremely well thought out for a reason. Um, you know, and like both Gillian and Nick have said, it's rigorous for a reason, and it was challenging. 
but it was good challenging. It was good to go through that process. It was good to take the team through that process. You know, we were the smallest agency to apply. There's four of us. And I imagine there's probably a lot of people that think if you're really small that you can't do it. You can. And you have to actually, because if you are that small, then there are ways that you can be diverse and there are things you can look at. And what that what the process of applying does is help you identify what they are and how you can do that. And I think it's important to note here as well that the application process is the starting line here. We're not saying, and Elizabeth and the Blueprint team aren't saying, they go, there's your status, done. But what they do is give you that framework and support you. They're not expecting you to have all the answers. They're not expecting you to just magically be perfect. But what they are requesting you to do is admit where it isn't going right, admit the gaps, acknowledge and take account accountability for that and commit to making that change. And I think that's, in terms of the process, that's maybe the hardest bit I think for people to get their head around is that it's not so much the questions, but it's admitting to yourself and admitting to your, your business and your agency that there are those gaps that exist and that isn't good, but, it's, but by signing up to this, you can make steps to actually make some proper changes. Yeah. I mean, and I guess a starting point is 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 being open about your data. Elizabeth, sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, and I, I think actually what I, I, I really love and what we love, so um, just to flag, I, we've got, we have four incredible um, judges who's taken part in the Blueprint Diversity Training, um, who judged all these application forms, Henry Rowling, um, Sasha Daly, Nairi Connell, who's also a strategy advisor on the Blueprint, and Olivia, who's a project manager as well. And I stepped out just to make sure we kept it as even and fair as possible, because I also know these guys. And I just wanted to flag something that's really interesting and really important about, about them. So first of all, what I love is that they are three fundamentally very different businesses but what they all have in common is they're all very very busy and despite this you know we I put a call out to a select group of people back in April who'd like to apply for this they all did now like other businesses this happened on the 24th of April like other businesses they were facing COVID like other businesses they were trying to work out where they were going to go and how they were going to maneuver in this whole new world but they still prioritize this application form and what's interesting so you know if I can just pick on blurred for a second what's really interesting with blurred is the amount of emails i've had through my linkedin where people said again i've launched a new agency we're going to make diversity important so we'll be in touch in two years because obviously we have to get the hit the ground running what blurred did was actually we'll do this from the beginning which i think is fascinating you know the perception has often been what people seem to say to me and they feel quite comfortable saying this to a black woman is let me get successful and i'll give a shit about you sorry i just swore by the way i hope my mom's not listening um which is a really weird message and then likewise the message we also get is from small agencies well no we need to get bigger first well sarah's just gone and shown actually you don't have to and then you know obviously manifest has had this incredible growth period and this sense of well we need to be quieter all three Three have literally just said this is something we genuinely believe in and a lot, what was interesting about the application form is I love the individual approaches and the level of innovation you got the impression that none of these people sat down and said let me go on google and type in what is DNI and let's just do a cut and paste each had developed things that work for them that fit with their brand ethos that fit with their personal beliefs but still had made diversity matter and that's why their applications were so strong and that's why also quite frankly for us as a team it's an absolute honor to be associated with them you know it's 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 you know it's through I love the idea that I can now say to to any agency that wants to know how to nail diversity don't call me call infusion comms call blurred called manifest london also, can I apologise? My glasses are steaming up. It's obviously such a hot discussion. Um, anyway, that's my point. I think, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think we'll take that as a compliment, I guess. Um, <laughs> what, uh, I wanted to actually stay with you, Elizabeth, um, yes. because obviously you, you launched this and it was uncannily well-timed, obviously, uh, with, yeah. with everything that's going on in the world now, um, yeah. you know, in terms of the... the, the the protests and movements and, and, and I guess an overall feeling that this is a moment of reckoning. Um, do you believe that's the case for the public relations industry? What has the response been like and has that surprised you? Um, so we, 
A lot of, we've already had an insane amount of applications. So I should say that, you know, we have the capacity as a team to do 30 applications per quarter. Um, so we get in your applications, there's four application deadlines per quarter. And um, when I spoke to your lovely colleague, Maya, a couple of weeks ago, she asked me what good look, looked like. And I said that in ideally in two years time, we'll have 40 agencies signed up and we've had 39 application requests. So, and this is in the space of a week and a half. So it's, and you know, if they, let's, see how many of those come through but it looks like there's a possible chance that you know my side hustle will have to start becoming a main hustle um there's been a huge positive response but look there's in in terms of we've got to i guess touch on black lives matters and what's happened here and there's a couple of things obviously um i'm very very conscious that in the lead up to well post covid a lot of big companies quietly cut their dni budgets um, I know of a very famous, well-known um, tech company, they slashed their, their, their diversity budget immediately. And loads of companies did this behind the scenes. And then of course, then we've had, you know, everything that happened with Black Lives Matter. And I think there's a couple of things. First of all, there's been a lot of conversations in the PR sector about diverse, about racism, systemic racism. And you know what, I've got to be honest, and we've got, we've, we've got ourselves a whole new bunch of allies. And I've got to be honest, some of this, I find extremely uncomfortable um, because I'm really worried and I'm trying to work out how many of these, you know, new allies have seriously reflected. This is first conversation. How many of these new allies have seriously reflected? You know, Trayvon Martin died in 2012. Eric Garner died in 2014. I went on my first Black Lives Matter protest in 2014. Um, the hashtag and the ideology behind Black Lives Matter has not changed since 2014, 2013. Um, you know, George Floyd died on the 25th of May. And I just need, I think new allies need to, you know, stop just reading why I no longer talk to white people about race, but ask themselves why they weren't listening before, why they weren't paying attention before. And that's a piece of work they have to unpick because if you can't answer that question, you are never gonna be a genuine ally. You will never fully get it because regardless, as I've said a million times before, racism is not an ethnic minority problem. Racism is a society problem that for far too long, black people have had to fight. You know, Black Lives Matter has been built on the bodies of black people. And the protest movement has also been built on the bodies of black people. Black people have died to protest for our basic rights. Black people have lost jobs, they've lost incomes. So you know, when you come and join us in June, 2020, you are literally coming on the top of a mountain of bodies of black people. And you need to acknowledge what's underneath. And you need to ask yourself, why was it okay before? And are you coming from a place of willful ignorance where you saw, you know, Black people, quite frankly, dying, um, getting, you know, you've heard of, you know, um, inequality of opportunity and um, all this systemic racism. You'd seen all these, you know, you'd heard of unconscious bias and you did nothing. And that's where the conversation with these new allies has to come. It's not for us to help you reflect. You need to do that work yourself. And I think by unpicking that work, I know what kind of ally you're going to be because there's a lot of fair weather stuff here. And I'm also very conscious that whenever there's a conversation about race, what tends to happen, especially, especially extreme situations. Uh, and, you know, a friend of mine said that this Black Lives Matter process feels like the white people's Black Lives Matter protest, because we've been saying this for a long time. This feels all this new energy, right? And so what, you know, a, a friend of mine said in terms, in terms of these kind of situations is that when you turn around and say to yourself, why didn't I acknowledge this before? Okay, I'm now going to do something. There always seems to be this area where people want to listen to us for a certain amount of time. We were allowed to say only so much. So everyone's like, yes, what happened to George Floyd was wrong. That's completely wrong. Racism is wrong. That's completely wrong. Ethnic pay gaps, you know, I might just be a bit quiet now. Do you know what I mean? And that's the point. At what point are you gonna start acknowledging your own role and also those really uncomfortable points that actually if all things were equal, you're not, maybe I'd be your boss. And then what have you done to benefit from that? I kind of say to me, you know, I'm sorry, I'm doing a massive rant, but I also say, you know, it's like, I, I you know, PR is made up predominantly of, of white women, right? I've seen so many white women over the years post about feminism. And where are these white women talking about racial inequality? The plights of their black and brown sisters never seem to matter. And to me, you know, white women who, know, who care about feminism but not about racial inequality are part of the problem as well, right? And so for me, there is that kind of stuff is like, first of all, new allies have to do the work. Then there's another flip side, and I'll be really quick, that also troubles me from the PR industry's perspective. It's like, this isn't even to me about the acknowledgement of racism. I am shook by how ignorant our sector is. I am really shocked that Renault Edo Lodge's book, 
how I, why I no longer talk to white people about race, came out in hardback in 2016, and it was in Sunday Times bestseller list. That's an important story. If your job, if our job is to know people, to understand the media, to understand trends, what I'm hearing from a lot of my white counterparts is, I never listened to black people. I never heard their stories. I never acknowledged their world. And that to me is really problematic in a set that's meant to be about people. That's me. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Please um, take the poll, uh, everyone that's watching. It's just to the right of your video. Um, very simple. And of course, any questions that you might have, you can also uh, in, use the chat window, which is to the right of the video as well. We will have at least five minutes at the end for questions. Um, Julian, over to you. The, the acknowledgement, that kind of acknowledgement and understanding that Elizabeth uh, was talking about, will it come easy to this industry Maybe not. Will it come more easily to this industry now? Do you feel like there is progress that is being made? I'm cautiously hopeful, I think. Um, and by that, I mean, there is, there's a lot of, of noise being made. There's a lot of books being read. There's a lot of articles being read. Um, so I think that is going to have some, some effect. Um, but I think the jury is still out as to how big that effect is going to be. Um, I also think that not just in PR, but in, in, in society, in, in, in British society especially, but also in the US. Uh, part of the issue is that we have operated with a very narrow definition of racism. Um, so it's easy to point out to neo-Nazis and white supremacists and say, those are the racists and systemic racism does not exist. Um, and I think now people are becoming um, more conscious of the fact of the, I guess, insidiousness and the, the covertness of systemic racism that someone can sit for a, a job interview and be rejected, not because the interviewer thinks I'm not gonna hire a black woman, but because they say to themselves, oh, I'm not sure if she'll be the right fit or I'm not sure if, if, if uh, our clients would warm up to her. That is also racism. Um, and you might, you know, walk out of that interview and say, oh, well, you know, she'll probably find another job in, 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 in a place that's more welcoming. But if you have everyone in that industry, all agencies making those decisions, then you're not going to be surprised when you take a macro view that there's no black person in the, in, in, in the industry, because everyone is, has, make, has made those um, quote unquote individual decisions that are not racist. Um, but it, they have a racist outcome. So, so I think um, the, the conversation needs to be about these kind of, of, um, of covert racisms um, and, and prevention of, of inclusion that prevent black people from coming into an industry or, from, or for, from thriving within a, an industry. Um, so when we broaden our idea of, of, of the problem as not something that that is about the n-word but something more insidious then we can start start to make change um so yeah i am cautiously hopeful um but yeah we'll, ha we'll have to see we will have to see nick um you have worked at a few different agencies um how important is this kind of training and education um and do you see it finally becoming more serious now I mean, it's, it's, it's essential. It's like Elizabeth said, how can we possibly do our jobs? Forget what's you know, right in terms of employment. Um, how can we possibly do our jobs properly if we don't understand every segment of society? Um, you know, we're about depth, and that includes depth of thinking, depth of talent. That's, that's ingrained in our business. So we intentionally bring on people with really divergent views and perspectives, because how else can we deal with really complex client problems and reach really diverse groups well beyond skin color if we, if we don't have that. So it's, it's so much more than just dealing with a, a kind of issue within this industry. It's about being the best we can all possibly be at our jobs. Um, and it is, you know, it's really hard. At, at, at Unity, we had really good diversity. Funny enough, it's harder at Blurred and that's because we have much more senior people and the awful truth is um, not so many senior non-white people rise to the top and I've been asking myself why it's harder at Blur than it has than it was at Unity and it's because of the type of work that we do 
And that's really damn sad, isn't it? You know, that there may be lots of account execs and lots of account managers, but by the time you reach kind of associate director level and above, the, the options are, there, are, there are fewer pickings. That's deeply, deeply sad. So unless we, are, we work really hard and all play our point and lean into the fact that it's harder Yes, it's hard to deal with it. You know, we have to deal with it. There aren't, we can't give ourselves the excuses that there just aren't enough people out there. We have to find those people. And again, this is something that I really lent into in the last few weeks since we got the status and since we've been through this process. You know, we have to work harder to do it. Otherwise we're gonna keep, you know, coming across the same issues all of the time. And if everybody spent even 5% more time proactively thinking about it, if everyone put DNI on every board agenda, just to ensure that it's brought up and people are actively asking questions about it, if everyone took responsibility in their company of coming back and saying, yes, but what about? It would make all the difference. And it even happened to me yesterday. We saw this immediate, immediate candidate and someone immediately wrote back in my team and said, yes, but they're white. And I'm like, brilliant, well done, thank you. Because, some, because, you know, often we've got massive pressures to deal with really complicated clients who often need very specific experience. So, it's, of course, it's easier for me always to find the pool of talent. Um, you know, a, of course, there's going to be more white people um, in that area, but we've got to question ourselves. And this, for us, was the first major step. And like I said, don't just do it when you're convinced you can get the accreditation. Do it because it's a commitment for you to be better. And if we all do that... The industry will be better, we will be better, the world will be better. And I know that sounds a little bit, you know, out there, but it's true. Um, and that's why, you know, I wrote about this. I said, we, we're never going to not do something because it's hard. And that means we're going to fail. And I'm going to say the wrong thing sometimes. Elizabeth knows this, you know, I, I, I will act and then I'll, I'll think. But if it comes from the right place, then we will all get there. And also, I just want to say to people, don't be scared. Don't be scared of trying to do this if your intent is right, because it's really easy to see this as a minefield as well and go, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to say the wrong thing. But again, better to have your heart in the right place and want to do the right thing for the right reason and make some mistakes than just not bother, than just be vanilla, than just sit on the sidelines and, um, and hope that the world around you changes, because we've, we're all responsible for playing our part in, in solving this problem. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said, it kind of, it made me think without an ability to accept that there will be some costs um, and some pain involved, um, you can't get any kind of real change. Um, so yeah. Sarah, maybe if I, if I come to you now and ask, you know, how, how hard is that kind of an equation? And do you feel that's something that the industry is willing to bear? Because I think for a long time, it's looked like they want the, the kudos and the praise um, without actually having to, um, to worry about what, what, what the, the, the costs might be of actually having to take action. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, this might be a very unpopular thing to say, but I think we are still too driven by ego in this industry. And I think to really get over this problem, we've got to let that go. We really have to just put that to one side, acknowledge what we've done wrong. And that isn't about going out and professing our guilt everywhere. But as Elizabeth said, taking the time yourself to unpick that and really looking internally to figure out what, why you did that and the, the responses that you maybe did have in there as well. And I think we talk in PR a lot about being big and being bold and being um, proud of what we do and um, standing up to clients and all this kind of thing and pushing back and, you know, making them, uh, you know, reinforcing our position and our worth. But that always, that discussion always seems to relate to our work, not to who we are as agencies and the people that we do and the actions that we take. And I think now, we are going to have to have those difficult conversations with clients. You know, I grew up in an agency, in agency environments where the client was always right and you did whatever they asked and you answered that email at half 11 at night. And that was the environment that I came out of because I didn't think it worked and I didn't think it was right and I didn't want to build an agency with that approach. But with that, you have to take responsibility of having difficult conversations with your clients. If, you, if they are working entirely all white teams or you know that they're doing a round of hiring and they're not looking to get diverse candidates in let alone interview your role as a strategic advisor is to say hold on 
you need to look at this and this is why you need to look at it. But I think that's where we, st we still struggle because we don't want to lose clients. And my worry is that because we're heading into quite a difficult economic time, we're less likely to do that. Um, and I think that's the wrong approach. I think we need to push harder on that, to be honest, right now and, and have those hard discussions. And you know what? You might end up losing some clients. Sorry. And that's uh, you're going to have to come to terms with that as well, because there are going to be some people who are just in conflict with you and with what you're doing. And if you're really going to take this to heart, you have to let those organisations go. And you have to move forward because if you stick with them, then you're not being true to yourself and actually giving everything that you can to improving the racial diversity in the PR industry and rolling it out to sort of other wider industries. Absolutely. Can I, can I just j jump in and, yes, and, and add something quickly as well? Just 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 to pick up on a point a point that Nick made that I thought was great and I wanted to expand on is that again this whole thing about self reflection. You know when when Nick points out, for example, the the, the lack of senior people that we have at BME levels. I know that this sector has had a retention rate around Black, Asian, mixed race, ethnic minority staff for a long time, and I was told that by a big agency about four or five years ago. That big agency has done nothing about that. So when we you know when I think about the diversity conversations I've tried to have our determination to focus on diversity but never ever challenge racial inequalities means that there are so many black, Asian, mixed race, ethnic minority people who have not had the careers they deserve, who have not had the paychecks they deserve, who've not had the opportunities they deserve. So for all these new allies, again, great to have you on board, but think about the people whose careers have been impacted by our inability to properly tackle diversity. If you Google diversity in PR, you can find articles that go back 10, 15 years, people saying the same thing, we need to do more, we need to do more. Let's look seriously about how people, how hard done by people have been. You know, I think it's appalling that I know so many, you know, young black women who became independent consultants before they necessarily wanted to because of the lack of opportunities. That's appalling. That is stuff that we need to unpick. You know, we, like Julian said, there is, there is this whole spectrum of, of, of what racism is and what inequality is. And we, as a sector, to be 92% white in 2020, that we've been complicit in something extremely toxic. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have about, I think we're gonna go, we're gonna run over just a little bit. Um, so we have at least another five minutes left. So please, um, any questions, please go ahead and put them forward. Um, and I will pose them to the panelists. But for now, maybe my next one, uh, and I'll put this to you, Julian. Um, are you concerned perhaps maybe not concerned is the right word, but do you think there is a chance there may be a backlash within the PR industry um, from, you know, majority groups who think that this kind of stuff is a threat to them? Hmm, that's, that's a very good question. Um, that's a possibility for two reasons. Um, one, that society is... is already endemically racist and essentially you know a lot of people who who harbor more extreme views and have been hiding them would be more empowered to say it now but all, but i think um also one of the reasons is that the way we've, we've approached uh dni in, in pr specifically um has tried to address it from uh from a numbers game alone. So there's the, we've not necessarily um, done the job of explaining to an entire agency of why it's important. Not that it's good for the bottom line, but why it's important societally, why it's morally right. So if you're not able to, to answer the moral question, um, then there's no reason why your employees would, would, need, would feel the need to get on board with diversity. So it just feels like a top down thing. It feels like, oh, this is what senior management want. And so we need to do it rather than, oh, I need to understand why this is good for me as a person and for the business as well. Um, so a, a, a backlash could could come about because people can't join those two things together. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm here and we need, to, we need to do diversity, but I don't know why. Um, and it's the why that is a societal thing, it's beyond PR, it's beyond one industry. Um, and once we're able to, to answer the, the why, once we're able to actually, you know, figure out how bad systemic racism is and why we need to fix it, then diversity becomes an obvious thing. 
um, for for companies to do. So yes, I, I am concerned, not necessarily about a, a backlash, but I, I am concerned that there's gonna be so much movement but not enough understanding. And when you have a lot of momentum without a solid foundation, then things would eventually break down the line. Mm. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, one is, the first one is from Richard Fogg, um, who asks, what kind of leadership would you all like to see from our industry's trade and membership bodies? Um, so who wants that one? I think that's got to be for Elizabeth, hasn't it? Elizabeth, oh. if you want it, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, well, I, I'm muted. Look, Julian's looking at me. Don't worry, I Googled libel and slander before this <laughs> webinar. Um, so, so I need to cover myself. And I also checked how many assets I own <laughs> to see what I could cover. Um, I think, I think you know, I'm... I, 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 I'm I think the CIPR did great work with the race in PR, um, uh, what do you call it, report. I want to give them kudos because I know that was a big body of work that started before everyone jumped on the Black Lives Matter bandwagon. I, I have nothing nice to say about the others. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Actually, no, I won't leave it at that. Um, I'll say that for me, what's what's been problematic is that is, you know, they, uh, they were in a position to lead and to have done a lot more a lot sooner. And it shouldn't have been down to people like myself and the people around this court. Um, you know, I there's a lot of people that run powerful organizations in our sector that own six figure salaries. Um, despite my couch that makes me look like I live in Versailles, which I don't, I am not on a six figure salary, but I wanna point out that, that I paid for the blueprint out of my own money. Um, I've paid 3,200 pounds of my own money to pay for the blueprint. Um, I am not rich. Um, I pay for that on my own cash, not my client money. So when I hear of, of organizations that have considerable more resources than me that have done nothing, I really don't have anything kind to say. Um, and I don't think we sh I don't think it, it should be down to me as well. I think there's something really vulgar sometimes about the way the race conversation goes, where, you know, it's down to, I, I, I'm not going to play the part of the black person that acts grateful because someone's offering me crumbs on the table when they should have allowed me in the room 10 years ago. So I've got nothing nice to say. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I think you said it all. Um, yeah. Next question: How do we uh, how do we measure progress more effectively across the industry and shine a light regularly on where we are falling short? That one is from Joanne Robertson, CEO uh, of Ketchum. So, repeat the question: um, How do we measure progress more effectively um, and shine a light regularly on where we are falling short? I think it's really simple. Retention and <laughs> retention, pay. Simple as that. If your staff, if you progression set, maybe and progression. Yeah, progression, 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 retention, those things. And of course, you know, um, you can't because those are statistics you can't hide from. You can't hide from that. Those are two statistics. How many, you know, if you've got a board of 30, how many of those are from ethnic minority backgrounds? How many have stayed? Um, it really is equal pay, equal opportunity. So those to me are the biggest, biggest measures. Um, mm. And also how much you invest. I'd really like, you know, I was going to be that person that was going to put a tweet out and say, you know, post underneath me, underneath this tweet, if you spent more money on DNI in the last month than I have. And I decided not to because I suspect. I wouldn't get many responses but I think that you know the very fact that a lot of agencies and and tech companies and in-house teams lots of organizations really thought that when COVID hit and also knowing the really vulgar reality that COVID has affected black Asian middle you know mixed race ethnic minorities more the very fact that when COVID hit the first thing they thought was let's cut our DNI budget speaks volumes of how vulnerable we are um, and so to me you know having that money in that's actually supported and also knowing that because, um, you know, BME staff haven't had the same equality of opportunity investing in their careers. That's why next year we're rolling out the first sector's BME leadership scheme, for example. It's important to give them the support that, you know, quite frankly, loads of crappy agencies haven't given them. You might, don't worry, that's not slander, by the way. I checked that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll also add, I think uh, we said earlier that there is so much um, emphasis placed on, on getting awards for um, diversity schemes and uh, and patting, our, patting our, ourselves on the back. Um, so I think less of that is actually needed. Um, and also more open forums um, where agencies can actually learn from each other, not because they want to uh, boast about what 
they're doing better. But 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 I think there there is such a lack of of intelligence sharing um, uh, amongst Asian people, and I think I think part of that is because um, some agencies don't want to be sustainable. Um, where agencies can actually learn from each other, not because. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think we've got someone's joined and and they can mute themselves. Unfortunately, I think it's Maya actually. Maya, can you mute mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um. Okay, so the poll results are in. 78% uh, said no, they didn't have um, anything in place. And interestingly, we only got 14 votes. That's out of, I mean, almost 100 that's watching this session. Um, so I just wanted to come before we go quickly, Sarah, Nick, did you have any thoughts um, on those two questions about um, measurement and about trade associations? Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, I have had a, a slightly different experience of, of the trade associations in, um, from a disability perspective, um, which is, I feel like it's a very hands-off approach that they take. Um, and I think like the rest of us, I don't think that approach is gonna work anymore. And I think leaving it to other people or discussion groups or I will statements is just not going to cut it. And I suspect um, that they may be, all organisations may be under more pressure from membership to do more. And I think it's right that their members hold them accountable to do that um, and influence change that way. Cause that isn't, that's, you know, the point of a member organisation, you have to be able to say, hold on, we're paying for this we would like you to do something so I would like to see it come from both sides I think on that one um, and in terms of measurement yeah I agree obviously both of what Elizabeth and Julian have said you you have to publish those figures and you have to look at retention ethnic pay gaps um, progression figures we have to be able to measure them and also sign up to the blueprint in all honesty if you want a way to measure it that's what we're giving you like it's there the framework is there so if you are looking for that Go and find out about it. I don't think I can um, top that. I agree totally. Yeah. And any other thing I'd say is, and I'm sure we all say this, contact us. I know in, uh, in other times we're competitors, but with this, I would really be personally happy to share the stuff that we have um, done. It's very personal to us. And that's what was really great about the application process is there were lots of open-ended questions. So we could show you know, how we're approaching things personally, but normally we keep the kind of stuff to ourselves. But in this instance, I personally would be really happy to share what we're doing and also be honest about our own gaps. And I think that's, you know, if, if anything that will help everyone get there quicker is only a good thing. It's not great that there's only the three of us. You know, we have, it's a huge responsibility that we're those first people selected. And I think part of our job is to now help other people kind of get that and for us to learn from others as well who just haven't applied yet so contact me if I can help in any way um and thank you for inviting us on and Elizabeth thanks for leading the charge on this yeah, thank thank you can I I know we're out of time so I just I just want to throw one last thing we didn't get a chance to unpick of that I think is quite exciting about the blueprint if I may say so myself one of the things that's really interesting about the blueprint is it includes how we work with our suppliers and our supply chain. So I know, you know, there's a whole lot of recruiters apparently who last year when I said that they, you know, recruitment com companies can be a problem, they all attacked me and told me they were wrong. I know a whole lot of recruiters, quite frankly, won't listen to a black woman that's ranting about diversity, but we will have collective power. And when we have 40 agencies on board, we will be going to our recruitment consultants and we'll be saying to them, do better. We'll be going to our supply chain as well. So all our customers, Roxhill Media, Kantar, all those com companies, we will be asking for their DNI quotas as well because why not just affect the black people working in PR, the Asian people working in PR? Why not affect those people that are also working in our supply chain? And collectively, that's when I think it becomes a really exciting proposition. It's not just about, about affecting change internally, but around all those other companies too. Okay, great. Yeah, that's that's um, um, very welcome too. Uh, please do ask our uh, panelists for advice and help. I'm sure they'd be happy to give it. Um, Thank you so much. It's been a really illuminating conversation. I really hope everyone found it helpful. Uh, I'm just going to end by saying that if there is a second phase to the blueprint, I really hope it's called the blueprint to the gift and the curse. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for that. I'm going to hand over to Maya now. Thank you very much. <laughs>